As Pride Month is coming up in a few weeks, we remember our 2S LGBTQ plus siblings who fought for equal rights, a fight that we are still continuing today. We have the honor of interviewing one of the most pivotal figures in 2S LGBTQ plus history. I'd want to begin by stating that our guest speaker, Martin Boyce, is one of the last surviving Stonewall activists. During June 28, 1969, police raids were happening across several 2S LGBTQ bars in New York, one of which is the Stonewall Inn in NYC's Greenwich Village neighborhood. In response to violent police raids, a series of protests by members of the 2S LGBTQ plus community started, which became known as the Stonewall Riots. This movement became a turning point in the gay liberation movement and the struggle for 2S LGBTQ plus rights in Canada and in the United States today. While we all share a passion for creating a safer and inclusive 2S LGBTQ community, we do not all use the same language. Our words to describe the same situations may be different. Language varies in Canada as well as the US among generations and with different experiences. While we do our best to use inclusive and respectful language, we may make mistakes. If there are ways to, we can improve, we ask that you please take notes and share with our volunteers when our talk is over. First, what was it like growing up as a gay kid in New York? People had to conform. Any kind of uh, raising your pinky when you were drinking coffee was no longer conforming. I mean, that could be uh, forced to be ostracized, to be punished by your parents. What they were trying to do at that era was to shame you. And that continued into the decade in which I became a teenager. But there is something in American history about the anti-hero, even the outlaw. And so what happened was the chickens came home to roost in the 60s. The 60s, and even Stonewall, was about the reaction to the 50s. You can't promise people freedom, demand they say they're free, and not be free. And the 60s was a test of that between the African Americans, women, and gay people tended to work with the NAACP stuffing envelopes or work with women's groups. They never thought they were a group. They did everything to silence our history, to silence our communication, to cut us off to make us lonely, and to make this very alone world in which you even had to find where you were a moral person if you were a gay person. And a lot of people could not help it. They knew they were gay. The 50s was a butch world, a world of masculinity. Uh, in the 60s, that changed. The spread of what freedom means and this desire to test it. And gays were watching, but we didn't know how far we were moving because there was no gauge, no press, no comfort, and no uh, encouragement. Stonewall was a shock to those who fought it because who wants to riot? I mean, it wasn't fun. It was desperate and it was necessary. So, when did you first realize you, your identity and when did you begin telling other people? What was your experience of coming out? Well, I always knew, and I always knew how important it was not to come out. People lived in the same neighborhood when I was growing up in New York City, maybe 30 years. If your name was soiled, and being gay would have soiled your name, it meant you had to move. If your parents were too poor to move, it meant you suffered. It was a very difficult world to maneuver uh, if you were a gay person and you knew it. But they did teach us how to be straight people so you could easily fool them. But we always knew we were fooling them. And that's a very stressful existence. Oh, it didn't seem so. Youth can handle a lot. I mean, I needed to have a sport. I knew the boys knew I had to have a sport. So I picked thoroughbred racing because I knew nothing about it and neither did they, but it was respected. You had to have all these things to link with them so they could give you some slack. Um, so tell us about New York City. 
What's it like living there, or how is it like living there? Oh, well, New York City in my time, I talked about the Stonewall time, was the greatest city in the world. And uh, we had a mayor who was into very liberal and into spending money for people having fun. And the uh, heterosexual world was very happy because there was hope, there was a lot of money, uh, there was a great deal of liberality. It was called Fun City. Uh, girls were on the pill, they didn't feel pregnancy, sexual uh, revolution was occurring. It was a wonderful world for the straight people. And then in New York, evening would fall. I think that this world was like what they call in the United States or in cinema the film noir, a dark world. And film noir really was what the kind of life gay people lived. And it was just as exciting. It was a very exciting life, but a very treacherous life. And it was very, very cruel. Uh, the police are cruel. Uh, they want us in jail. The psychiatrists are cruel, and they want us in mental institution. And the clergy was cruel. They wanted us in hell. Oh, we knew what we were against. And I remember the first incident I had with cops was I was crossing Central Park. I was about 16. And I didn't want to wait for the bus. And I thought, you know, I'm just going to walk through the park. And I did. And I heard this blood-curdling scream that was just could not shake off, very close to where I was uh, passing. And I ran out in the street. When I got there, I saw a police car, so I thought I should tell them. And I went over to them. And I said, you know, I heard this terrible scream. I think someone's being attacked. I think someone's being hurt. I said, you should go and look. And they said, and he looked at me, the cop, and he looked down at me like a Marine. And he scratched his chin. And he said, what were you doing in the park? I said, I was crossing the park. He said, well, you don't have a dog. You don't live here, do you? I said, no. And he said, so what were you doing in that park? And all of a sudden, I realized I was being accused. They were all looking at me. And he told his friends, come over here, listen to this kid's queer story. And they all came over. They made one opening, and I just slipped through it. And I vowed never again would I ever confront, talk to the police, ask for help or anything. And that's the first thing that gay people learned in those days. It was, don't trust the police. They're not your friend. If you were gay and acting gay or discussing a gay thing or being too enthusiastic about fashion or something you overheard, you could be attacked. And of course, the attacker was always forgiven. And so one of us would look in front and your friend would look behind you and you would notice anything and your friend would say, that's cross, I don't like the way this guy's walking. Here's a whole bunch of people are coming. It was stressful to try to get anywhere and be free. And there were these police that were called the Vice Squad, and that was a squad of police that went undercover in gay clothing and would try to get you to uh, somehow involve yourself with them, and then they would arrest you. There's terrible consequences, especially with people who hadn't told their parents. And uh, they were really very good-looking people, but one thing they never did, they never changed their shoes. So their shoes are always uh, what we used to call straight guy shoes. And even as good looking as they were, they could attract nothing on Christopher Street because everybody in five minutes knew on Christopher Street who was the vice squad, they were called. And it's the first thing they taught you when you came out, look at their shoes. If the guy is too good looking for you, over your class, you're too lucky that night, maybe you are, look at their shoes. So, but Christopher Street, you could go back and forth. They couldn't attack you. There was safety in numbers. And there was a wonderful bar. And the first time, it was a bar in which you could dance. And gay people did not like each other. Different groups despised each other. But in this bar, you had to get along. So we were learning toleration of each other. Uh, I was called scared drag, like Boy George. You know, people would know I was a boy, but gender bending. Others were called uh, A-gays, they were in suits. All inhabiting the same bar, not particularly caring for each other. But that's what made the bar interesting. And, the, and so, that's, so on the night of June 28th, we were going to go 
and I ran to my friend who was scared drag, like I was, and he told me you're not getting in because they wouldn't let me in. I said, okay. So it was you know, Friday night in New York, something else you could do. Didn't have to go there. And I heard people behind me in this hush and rush voice and people were moving away from the bar. It was about five uh, stoops away from me. It's talking about a raid. In those days, if you weren't in the raid, the thing was to watch the raid from outside because it was amazing. They would bring out drag queens who were cheerful uh, and loving it. And they would, uh, they would come out to cheers, and then there were people that were trying to hide their life, their world, lawyers and things, came out to jeers. And the young were going sh without papers, or going straight into the paddy wagon. So we would almost victimize ourselves by making this a form of entertainment. And there's this word schadenfreude, meaning you're glad it's someone else's sorrow, and it's not you. And that was in operation. So I thought, let's go look. And I went. And passed this paddy wagon and this car, and it was like a, a circle, a semicircle around the bar of patrons that were let go, gays that were watching, people that were there. And I saw this police come with this drag queen, pulling and really roughing the queen up and throwing the queen, who was a trans, throwing the queen into the back of a paddy wagon. And then something that I never saw or never thought would happen, and I should have realized then it was going to be a night like no other. The queen kicked him on the shoulder and sent him flying back from the paddy wagon. He took a deep breath, jumped on that paddy wagon, and you just heard bone and flesh against metal and groans that were going silent because the Pierce's energy was spent. And he was very happy. And he got out and he closed the doors and he looked at us and did what they always did, said, all right, you people. And he didn't use this language that I'm using as polite as today. You saw what you came to see, now get out of here. And there's enough provocation for the ride to begin all at once for different reasons. Everybody thought, we were right. Everybody thought, let's go for it. One night of freedom. Let's go for it. We're here, they're here. We didn't start it, let's do it. And we did it. And in a riot, it's a very strange thing, it's cardioscopic. You don't stay in one place. You constantly move. And you smell burning cloth, sweaty bodies. You hear smashed glass. And you don't see anything. But you pick up this vibe of anger about all these people around you. Queens are very intelligent. They all got very limp-wristed to mock them. And these guys, masculine marine types with helmets and shields and uh, tear gas and everything, and butch as could possibly be, could not believe. They were called in to confront this bunch of queens who didn't know what to do, but knew they had to provoke them. We knew they had to keep this right going. And that's something everyone knew, as long as we could. So we formed a kick line, and we sang a song to them, that we were the village girls, we wear our hair in curls, we wear our dungarees above our nelly knees, and enemies like Nazimova and Ms. Marsha, who would not even speak to each other or say hello, were fighting side by side. Everyone felt that night this need to this express this for no purpose other than one night of release. Never as a group since antiquity were gay people credited with the spirit to fight for what they wanted. As individuals, sometimes they said we could, but there was no example even to ourselves of consensus. So this individual pride of these gay people that made up the Stonewall crew which was all about their own individual pride and vanity, became a consensual pride, a people's pride. And then we had become a people. So what was your role in organizing the first Pride Parade? Well, the first Pride Parade is my favorite moment in all of the gay history I had lived or seen. We got there, and there weren't enough people, and we had to go single file. 
And it wasn't Fifth Avenue. It was this horrible Sixth Avenue and only a little part of it. And someone was saying, well, this is really the first run. It didn't sound very good. And, you know, there had been a lot of um, anti-gay bashing that year, the year before. So I said, all right, but we're going to do it anyway. Let's just do it. So we went single file. And we were marching up. I was very, very nervous. And uh, what happened was, though, that a lot of gay people did come to watch this peculiar event, even that then. And they couldn't contain themselves. I could see people fighting with themselves, like, what should I do? And breaking through the police barrier and joining us. And then there would be people cleaning windows or waving their, their rags to us in support. Not a majority, but enough to make you feel, well, let's keep doing this. And all of a sudden, people were marching. Gays were joining, jumping in. And tourists were being encouraging, saying, we never saw anything like this. Go do it. And it was amazing what was happening. So it started out as a question mark. And this fearful journey we were going to take, and felt like we had to do it, ended in this exclamation point with all the hills in the southern part of the park covered with gay people, the multitude. Who knew there were that many gay people? And on top of one hill was this Latina uh, trans who was doing this modern dance of freedom, this bird-like movement and moving towards the sun. And I, for the first time, I understood modern dance and what its power was. And I understood Martha Graham. I understood all of that just by her doing that. It was an amazing education. So it was my favorite. It was that that really made Stonewall uh, memorable in the sense of a commemoration for the courage of the year before. And it wasn't wasted. It wasn't being dissipated. It wasn't being ignored. It didn't matter if they did. But it wasn't being ignored by us. So you've said in a couple of interviews back then that you did drag. Can you describe us your art of drag? Oh, yes, certainly. I did what was called scare, like frightened, scare drag. And that was a terminology that the fuller drag queens, the real drag queens, the real impersonators, invented for us because they thought we looked so bad. But the point was to be like Boy George. The point was to gender bend and, you know, let them know you are a boy. That was called plucking nerves. You pluck straight people's nerves. You get on the subway and everybody had to look at you like they had to, you know, really look at you, not overlook you. It was a way of getting back for all the pain they were causing by bothering them, by saying, you know, your world isn't as perfect as you think you are, even if we use ourselves as a catalyst and as, a, you know, a negative aspect. It was just, even if it was negative, you wanted to be seen or be felt or be heard even by yourself. I mean, if it was a negative gay image on the movies, you'd go see the movie. and not complaining about the movies because you want to see yourself. You want an affirmation of yourself, not just the mirror in the morning. But what you needed was other people to know that you were gay, but you were proud. So another question I would like to ask is, the 2S LGBTQ plus community is still existing today, and there are still many struggling queer kids out there. I just want to ask, how can the youth help support the 2S LGBTQ plus community today? By, they can support it by being themselves. I mean, that kind of courage, that kind of battle within you, within your family, within your community, I mean, that takes a great deal of courage. You have a chance to truly envision freedom, and not everybody has that, and we have that, and we have a chance to recreate our history, refound our history, reclaim our history. And this is what we must do. And because that is the basis of pride in the end, to be able to read about yourself, to be able to be proud of people who are like you. Thank you, Martin, for your time today. Thank, thank you for telling us your story. I'm sure millions of kids out there 
who are struggling with their identity will be inspired with your story. Thank you very much. We appreciate your sacrifices and um, all your hard work, even though it was probably really scary. But it's brought us here, and now, I mean, we can have open discussions about stuff like this. It's and it's it's life-changing for some people, and Thank I you. really appreciate it. And I'm glad you're using the word work, because that's what we're doing. We're working together to inform people of something they really need to know. Hey.